Hello, good afternoon. I'm Tom Coffeen with InfoBlocks, as Keith mentioned. Um, let's see, are you, somebody else is driving? Okay. Um, yeah, so I'm coming down with the cold. My presentation will probably be a little more listless and drooly than it usually is, unfortunately. Uh, between jet lag and the tropical weather here in London, uh, it's finally caught up with me. So uh, I have about 30 something slides and 20 minutes or so to deliver them in. So I'm going to have to go kind of quick here. It's sort of a grab bag of information about uh, things that are going on in DHCP v6. And we heard a little bit about it from Stephen in the last presentation. Uh, a look at some of the operational challenges that we're running into. My company, Infoblox, has. Uh, a product you don't you, why use an open source DHCP v6 server when you can buy one that's my question to the audience here so we have D, uh, DDI technology DHCP v6 DNS and IP address management everything stitched together uh, a lot of offerings around security and automation anybody playing the buzzword bingo there's automation again for you so First up, IPv6 first on the agenda IPv6 is here uh, and really we mean it this time uh, we've been hearing about uh, the, the impending arrival of IPv6 for many years now. Uh, there's some statistics, though, that, that really indicate that there's some traction. And I know there's some challenges here in the UK, and I'd like to hear more about that offline. Um, but uh, we'll review a little bit about where IPv6 is at, just with, the, with a few graphs. And then DHCP v6, we'll look at some of the things in v6, DHCP v6 that are more or less working and some other things that uh, are more or less not working all that well or, or have some challenges and then uh, I don't know I don't I don't I won't have any grand conclusions from any of this but I'll let you draw your own IPv4 is depleted so here we are with uh, the marketing graph here graphic here that shows the run out and all the the various rears with the exception of Afrinic uh, so of course uh, Aaron and let's see we've got Aaron down to their Last slash eight in the U U.S. Ripe, of course, has been below their last slash eight for quite some time now. Um, got the same thing in AP NIC. Uh, same thing with LAC NIC. Uh, Aaron, by some estimates, is supposed to run out of IPv4 completely within the next couple of months. So, along with that, we're seeing a lot of adoption of IPv6. Uh, it's obviously happening in pockets and corners. It, it's not uh, not universal certain geographic regions where there's a lot of uptake of IPv6, other places where it, it's not, there's not that much of adop adoption. But here we see a graph that shows uh, sort of the general upward trend of IPv6 adoption globally. And, and this, is, this statistic is basically the traffic that's arriving um, to Google services over IPv6. And you can see just within the last like six to 12 months, there's uh, quite, a, quite a growth there. It's above 4% now. Here in the UK, 0.33%. Uh, that's what Google is seeing uh, accessing uh, IPv6, access of, IP, of services over IPv6. So quite some room for growth of IPv6 compared to what's happening in some other markets. So here we have Verizon wireless IPv6 deployment. Of course, Verizon is a broadband provider and mobile provider in the, in the US. 63% uh, of their traffic is now over IPv6. Uh, T-Mobile in the U.S. has around 46%. And then uh, Telenet, which is Belgium's provider, is at 51%. And Deutsche Telekom is around 31%. So here in Europe, obviously, Belgium and Germany are a little bit ahead of the, of the curve. And France as well, as far as having uh, more robust IPv6 deployment. One exception is the uh, smaller ISP here, uh, Andrews and Arnold who offer IPv6 services. They actually come in top rated uh, for product support. So here I'll give, a, give them a big sloppy wet kiss, even though I'm sick, and point out that they have 27.96% uh, IPv6 deployment at this point. So uh, a standard by which all ISPs in the UK should be measured. So I'll talk a little bit about uh, DHCP v6 prefix delegation and a couple of things that have happened related to ISC's formal DHCP v6 or DHCP server. Um, we know that, D that prefix delegation works, um, and this is something that's probably uh, of interest to service providers where you're handing out uh, prefixes to CPE devices. Uh, if you had to hand out those, those prefixes through a relay, you ran into issues where you couldn't expose um, 
options that were added by the relay on the server end so that you could do some common sense provisioning. So if you had tools put in place where you were actually looking at options coming from the client that allow you to do some correlation of what the device is and correlate that to, you know, say a circuit ID or a service ID number, you, you really lost that visibility because you, you couldn't expose the options that were being added by a relay. Well, now in ISC 4.3 that's been fixed, so custom provisioning of DHCP v6 for a particular client type or circuit ID is possible, and you can create classes now based on DHCP v6 relay provided options. So that's really a positive development. Uh, it gives you more flexibility and robustness in whatever your deployment of DHCP v6 is if you're handing out uh, prefixes to CPE, your ability to track uh, and, and maybe provision those a little more effectively. And the syntax of it is very simple, very straightforward. So that's something that if, if you're doing that today, you may want to look into how that might uh, be helpful in your, your current deployment. You can go to the ISC website to learn more. It's actually back up. I made this slide last month when uh, they were down because of the horrible malware infection that they got. Uh, they do have something called response policy zone, which I don't know, maybe that would have prevented uh, the infection of, of their particular uh, website, but I don't know that uh, they were running it. DHCP v6 fingerprinting is something else that you, you may want to leverage in operational environments. This may be of interest to service providers who are uh, looking at, for a way to characterize CPE devices. So, you know, we know there's always been the challenge in IPv6 of having uh, CPE devices that su properly support IPv6, and many of the providers that are actually uh, providing IPv6 as a service to their customers have a short list of CPE devices that, that they'll allow you to, to plug into the network. Um, over time, though, I, I think as more and more CPE providers get up to speed on adding robust v6 functionality in their devices, um, it, it may be helpful to actually be able to detect some of these devices on the fly, and DHCP v6 fingerprinting might be uh, a way to do that. So the basic process is very simple. You've got a client and a server. You've got the solicit packet that comes from the client to the server. And then from there, uh, let's see, no, no presentation is complete without some screen capture slides. You can actually look at what's being provided in that solicit packet. Now, this is just information that shows up in every solicit packet that shows up from a DHCP v6 client. And it actually it, it happens in v4 and in v6. In v4, it's option 55, which is a, a list of numbers, basically that are uh, particular options in the, uh, the request packet in, uh, in V4. And so here you can see uh, in the case of V6, we get a solicit, a message type of solicit. We get a client identifier. We get an option request. We get an elapsed time. We also get requested option codes under the option request fields, and we get identity association for non-temporary addresses. So we don't really care about any of these elements in the DHCP V6 packet per se, the solicit packet per se. Uh, what we're really after is sort of the order that they go in, and their, the presence in the order that they go in allows us to actually figure out what, uh, what device type um, is requesting a, a DHCP v6 address. So this is particularly useful in environments, and this is maybe not so much of interest to service providers, but an enterprise where you have BYOD, where you have folks, and there's another buzzword for you, where you have folks bringing in devices from home, you know, wanting to use uh, mobile devices, tablets, et cetera, and you, you need to have some way of, of understanding what's being brought into the corporate uh, network environment and whether or not you're going to allow particular devices on the network. Uh, you can actually use this as a tool to prevent certain devices from connecting, but probably more interesting in the, in the medium term is being able to characterize what types of devices are connecting to the network. Um, so it works perfectly well in v4, it works in v6. So mentioning BYOD, you're probably looking at this slide and asking yourself, well, Fedora 17 and BYOD, what do those two things have to do with each other? Well, here's the answer. Anybody need a translation of GTFO? <laughs> so the cool thing about it is actionable data. Uh, it, you know, you can't really look at it as a security mechanism. It's, it, it's data that's being provided automatically within a DHCP v6 solicit packet or a DHCP request packet. 
um, allows you to type the device. You could, you could prevent certain devices from getting on the network, but obviously easily spoofed and, and worked around uh, by anybody that uh, knows what they're doing hacking-wise. But really, the more important thing, as I mentioned, is the reporting capability that it gives you. And the fact that it's passive, there's no additional transactional overhead. So if your DHCP server supports this, um, and as far as I know, no open source DHCP v6 servers do, um, there's no additional overhead in the transaction. It's just basically free data that you're taking advantage of to, to characterize what's connecting to the network and potentially disallowing it from getting a DHCP address if you, if you think that that's what the policy that you need in place should be. And compared to, say, uh, in-map OS detection, which is obviously very very active and very aggressive. So right now, there's, this is actually out of date. I think there's quite a few more DHCP fingerprints in the FingerBank repository, which is an open source repository of these fingerprints. Um, right now, there's, there's not any for DHCP v6 that I'm aware of. Uh, we, uh, our product allows you to actually characterize, define those DHCP v6 fingerprints. Um, we have some that are predefined that we've detect it on our own, and then you can actually go in and define them as devices connect to the network, et cetera. But going forward, it would be great to see, and this is something where because there isn't the, the sort of um, broad deployment of, of DHCPv6, we really don't have a lot of operational data to draw upon to then give us the fingerprint assortment that would allow us to better characterize the device. So it's the, the classic chicken and egg problem that we see all the time with IPv6. Uh, but over time, you know, hopefully with more DHCPv6 deployment in the wild, uh, we'll see uh, a, a bigger database of DHCPv6 fingerprints that we can leverage. So my question about DHCPv6 failover, uh, it's often repeated that it's not needed unless you're doing prefix delegation. Uh, but many, many, many of the enterprises that we talk to on a regular basis, they're insisting on it. And they're not doing prefix delegation, obviously. Uh, but basically, they want, if they have a feature in IPv4, they want the same feature in IPv6. It's that feature parity or functional parity idea. And you can't talk them out of, you know, the fact that they think they want it, they're going to insist upon it. Um, we tell them the workarounds, but... Right now, everyone's sort of waiting for the, the standards to, to coalesce around this. And as Stephen mentioned, um, basically, we've got some drafts in the ITF that are talking about the failover requirements that would give a developer some idea of what, what it should entail, uh, and then some, some actual workarounds. Uh, there's actually, a, a, I think there's an RFC that actually walks you through some of the workarounds if you don't have a failover in DHCPv6, since you don't have failover in DHCPv6. And that looks like. One of those looks like this. So you take a prefix, a slash 64, and you split it into two slash 65s. And then you just use your DHCPv6 preference option. Uh, you know, half of your clients are going to use 255, and the other half are going to use zero. So this works well enough in, you know, in a, a, a small deployment. Over time, you get uneven distribution of leases between servers. And obviously, there's no, um, you know, you can't track state and you can't maintain state. If there's a, if there's a failure, you, you have to wait for, for stuff to fail over. So there's the RFC I mentioned, additional workarounds. Uh, you can, redundancy considerations for DHCPv6. There, this is one method. There's a couple more in the document. And if you're something you're interested in, you can find out more in that RFC. So another thing that's potentially really problematic in dual stack environments, and this is specific to, you know, I mean, I think we're all of the mind that, that going forward for the, the short and medium term, we'll see dual stack, we'll see IPv4 and IPv6 uh, living in parallel in the same uh, environments. And so we've got our uh, auto addressing types uh, in, in V6 that you know, we're familiar with to a greater or lesser extent. Slack, obviously, that allows uh, auto configuration of the, the, allows the host or the node to auto configure, uh, generating an inter interface identifier that uniquely, identif and it, I, uniquely identifies the interface on a subnet. And then, obviously, we've been talking about DHCPv6, uh, but we've got both the stateful and the stateless variety of it. Um, stateful is uh, what we typically associate with uh, DHCP and v4. Uh, we get not only the address, but configuration parameters. Um, and it offers the capability of automatic allocation to reusable network addresses and additional configuration flexibility. Stateless, uh, basically, we're, we're using Slack to get the, the address on the node, um, but we're, we're actually 
using DHCPv6 to get the options that we need to know about, say, DNS servers, et cetera. Um, and this is where things get a little weird. Okay, so here's the, the flags that we expect to see uh, coming from router advertisements um, when we're doing auto addressing. And you know, with Slack, we've got an A flag, which is basically the auto addressing flag, the M flag, which is the manage flag, which tells us to use DHCPv6, and the O flag, which is the other flag, which tells us whether or not we're getting our options from DHCPv6. And so what you would expect to see, um, the, the fun comes when you try to do things that you would typically do in, in a, a LAN environment where you're basically releasing uh, a lease for an address and getting a new one. And maybe you want to do that from, uh, you, you want to have a release and replace uh, using one auto addressing method in the same auto addressing method, or maybe you want to go from one auto addressing method to another one. So say going from Slack to Slack or from Slack to DHCP v6 stateful. Uh, or finally, um, wanting to hang on to an address and actually add an address from another auto addressing function. And what ends up, I'm not going to read through all these, but the, the first one here, for instance, host hasn't acquired any addresses and no RA, so in this instance, we're not actually expecting to, to use RA, which would mean that we're not using Slack. We're, using, we're expecting to use DHCPv6, stateful DHCPv6. So some popular OSs acquire DHCPv6 addresses, no problem. But if you go to the second one, if the host hasn't acquired any addresses and you set flags according to this, which would indicate uh, stateless DHCPv6, some popular OSs acquire other info from DHCPv6, and others do so only if the A flag is also set to 1. Um, so this is just an example of, of the sort of unpredictability that you're going to see in dual stack environments. And where you're running DHCPv6, um, it, it's, it's not obviously related directly to, to being in dual, a dual stack environment, but where you're running DHCPv6 and you're not able to have a consistent policy that allows you to just do something like DHCPv6 stateful, which ideally you'd want to just stick to one auto addressing function. But if you have devices that need to do Slack, some devices that need to do Slack, other devices that need to do stateful DHCPv6 or stateless DHCPv6, as soon as you start trying to do releases and renews, you, the behavior starts to get a little dicey and weird. And this is where, you know, really the solution is you have to test. It's going to depend on what's running in your particular environment. Um, making sure that you've actually tested and made sure that things are going to behave in a sane fashion. And there's actually an IETF draft that I don't think I included, uh, but if you want more information on that particular one, uh, that's something I can give you offline after the presentation. And that's, that's basically all I had. I look forward to any questions and anybody's actually, is anybody actually deploying DHCPv6 in this group? Yay. All right. Two folks? <laughs> All right. So, so this presentation was, what's that? Oh, very good. Uh, this presentation was relevant to two people in the audience. I consider that a victory. <laughs> now I'm going to go back to my hotel room and pass out. Yeah. Any questions? No? I'll come back in a, in a few years when the UK has more IPv6 adoption and DHCPv6 is running everywhere. All right. Uh, will it be a couple of years, three years, five years? All right. Thanks for your attention.